these faulty lithium ion batteries can cause explosions. All right, so the subject of my presentation today is one that's been probably on a lot of people's minds who are attending this show, and it's certainly something that we hear about a ton on the media. Uh, and for a lot of people, this is a relatively new topic to hear about. Uh, but for myself, this is something that part of me is kind of saying, finally, it's out there uh, that the broad awareness of the potential hazards of lithium batteries are a little bit more in the mainstream. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about here is literally just my 20 year life experience of dealing with lithium batteries as they apply to lighter electric vehicles. And to give everybody just a little bit of context on the incidents that we hear about that now, how far things have come along and where things might go a bit in the future. Um, so this uh, actually first page slide here is an example of something that I was just off the subway one day and sure enough, on the side of the, uh, the sidewalk there was a burnt out electric scooter. Uh, and to me, it was kind of no surprise. Um, this incident is something that never made the news, never made the media. And at this time, I had known of countless instances, first hand, second hand, third hand, of people experiencing fires, especially with lower cost electric scooters like this. And it didn't seem like it was actually making much traction or awareness in the media, and certainly not people uh, selling and purchasing these kinds of vehicles. Uh, so we're going to start off just rewinding the clock back 20 years. So back in 2004 is when I first got heavily interested in electric bicycles. And at that time, lithium batteries were almost this holy grail technology that was just around the corner. So we were dealing with electric bicycles running off lead acid batteries, nickel metal hydride and nickel cadmium. And the batteries would weigh about 20 pounds and you'd get kind of 25 to 30 kilometer range on it. Uh, these lithium batteries promised to be less than half the weight and deliver over double the range. So kind of four to five times more energy density, which would be a groundbreaking improvement in how practical and useful an electric bike could be. So naturally, I jumped at every opportunity to purchase lithium batteries as they became available. Um, back in that time, most of the lithium batteries that you would purchase and use on an electric bike were large format cells. So you can see here, these would be lithium polymer batteries uh, formed in kind of a large prismatic pouch. Um, there were cylindrical batteries that kind of uh, format you're typically used to seeing when it's in a metal can, but they were quite a bit larger than the cylindrical lithium batteries you have now. Um, and there were an awful lot of these prismatic batteries. So they'd have the battery in a rectangular shape. And to me, this seemed like such an ideal format. Each battery stacked incredibly efficiently and you could almost assemble them like bricks. They just click together. You would have a screw terminal to link the post to one another. Uh, and you could very easily build up batteries of different sizes and capacities uh, and have a, an electric bicycle that had you know, substantially more range than was otherwise available. Accompanied with that was an endless supply of failures and issues. Um, so the very first uh, batteries we brought in from China, within about two months, almost every single pack started to swell inside uh, with enough pressure that it was bursting open the aluminum casings like that. Um, these batteries that were in the uh, more rigid metal cans, I thought would be safer. And now it's sort of contained in a metal casing. Uh, there were lots of people importing early models of these batteries and they seemed wonderful. And then you'd have random incidents. This happened in my uh, basement. I was just using the battery, charging it once and then noticed that it was swelling uh, and turned into a little bit of a banana shape. Um, so there the pressure inside was causing the, the casing to expand. Um, here was one of my first cases of something close to resembling a battery fire. Now this is not actually a lithium battery fire here. What you see here is the electric circuitry failing in a way where the battery's discharging through the wires internally and generating enough heat to cause little burn marks on it. The batteries here were the first mass sold lithium electric batteries on the market. This was from a company called Easy Bicycle. And this had similar to these, these big format cells inside them. Uh, and they were made by a company called Filion. Um, that's, you know, means nothing to anybody, but they're just one of many early uh, Chinese companies that were selling lithium batteries and that were made available for people to build into e-bike battery packs. Uh, the one that you see here, uh, what we were doing at this point was a independent discharge test on every battery before we used it ourselves or gave it to a customer. And on this one, it did something very funky on the discharge. Uh, originally, it has a discharge graph, this nice smooth curve. Um, I can't remember entirely the context, but we tested it once again and saw these very bizarre behaviors going on with the voltage. And of course, the battery got extremely hot. There was this pungent order of this, you know, volatile lithium 
uh, electrolyte fumes sort of filled our shop. Um, no fire or anything, but it illustrates the kind of issue rate that we were seeing with batteries in this time. So uh, part of the reason why we were confident to bring in these batteries in some quantity is that when I took apart some power tools, uh, these are specifically the yard work line of tools that were being sold at fire, they were using the same brand of cells as this company that was supplying us these electric bicycle batteries. So to me, that gave me a great vote of confidence that if Canadian Tire has endorsed this company as a, as a component supplier for their brand of uh, outdoor cordless power tools, um, that we could count on it for electric bicycles. But that confidence proved totally unwarranted. So uh, these are some instances that happened when, I guess within the first, up until about 2009, that Falian battery, uh, we had seen that instance where you know it swelled up and got hot, never had any fires. Um, we were selling them for about four to five years. And then one day I got a call from my very good friend and classmate who had one of these batteries on her e-bike. She helped me start this little electric bicycle club uh, out at the university. And she was out walking her dog with her partner, uh, had the battery charging in her house just by a laundry basket and came back to see the entire basement on fire. And that was the first time we had not just a close call, but something that was a major eye-opener about the massive risks that these lithium batteries contain in them. And they're kind of like a, a wolf in sheep's clothing that looks like a safe thing. Everyone's used to seeing batteries, but that it could just spontaneously uh, burst into flames like this was very, very alarming. This other instance here, uh, this was a lithium polymer battery in that same format. The lithium polymer batteries were attractive because they were lighter. You don't have this metal can. And at this point, we had assumed that those early problems of them swelling up were largely taken care of. This particular case was one of the staff at our company had his battery charging on his living room and uh, woke up. Did he wake up? I can't remember the exact context. Luckily, he was there uh, when it started hissing and then erupted into a fireball. He was able to, since he was sitting on a carpet in the middle of his room, he was able to drag the carpet out onto the patio porch to get that outside the house and then of course attacked it with a fire extinguisher. Both of these two incidents happened while the batteries were charging. Um, this case was another good friend of mine. He was riding an early prototype e-bike that we had made back when we were students at university uh, and he was using what was a very popular choice at the time which is a lithium polymer battery sold for the RC radio controlled airplane enthusiast. Um, so in this point the RC hobbyist we're kind of at the cutting edge pioneer of using the uh, most advanced battery technology and the most advanced motor technology because they're trying to cram as much power as they can into a lightweight electric plane or electric helicopter. And for them, the risk of something catching on fire is of minimal consequence because the plane is up in the sky. Uh, the actual size of the battery is fairly small. Um, and this is an industry that was really taking off in this time period as the radio controlled enthusiasts switched en masse from doing uh, all gas powered little engines to electric flight. And then we saw a transition happen where the electric flight was now actually outperforming gas flight, not just in terms of power, but even the range that you could get, how many hours you could fly. And the other thing is that these batteries were incredibly cheap. Um, and uh, so that made it a natural go-to place for people in the early experimental phase of uh, building homemade electric bikes in the early 2000s. Um, this was a very popular go-to. Uh, so my friend was uh, riding with the battery just on the side saddlebag of his bicycle down Granville Street when it started hissing and smoking and he jumped off the bike and it caught fire and burned on the sidewalk and he put up all the garbage once it had extinguished itself and then went on and this doesn't become an incident. There's no, you know, fire investigation or report of any kind. We just went, holy smokes, uh, that's the end of us ever touching lithium polymer batteries. So we made a very clear decision to, to stay well clear of that chemistry. There's another thing that I became aware of pretty early on in this system, which is the intrinsic hazards that come with transporting and shipping lithium batteries. So even right out of the gate, lithium batteries had been classified as class nine dangerous goods. That's the same kind of classifications for, you know, compressed propane cylinders and any other hazardous materials that are a significant risk if something goes awry. Uh, but the awareness of this from people dealing with lithium batteries was extremely limited. Um, this is a shipment that we got on one of our uh, earlier sample, or an earlier batch of batteries that we had shipped to us. You can see YVR up there, it's a DHL package, and it came with lots of other boxes, no comment or note about it. I'm like, wait a minute, this is not good at all. There were burn marks on the cardboard box itself. 
um, when I dug into what had happened on here, what became apparent is that you can see the battery was simply packed in regular plastic packing material. Uh, in the course of handling any packages, they get pounded and abused. Uh, and in this case, the battery had been crushed um, and all of the internal wires that connect the, um, the, the cells to the circuitry that protects the battery were then able to get squished and short together internally. Um, so this is an electrical fire, it's not a battery fire, but it was a big wake up call that, whoa, this, this could be catastrophic if something like this happens on an airplane. And sure enough, this stuff was happening on airplanes. Um, and so if you look at uh, reports from the various uh, airport safety agencies in 2005, 2006, there's a lot of big um, documents and press releases informing and making awareness about this risk of shipping lithium batteries and especially on trying to enforce a safety environment around the batteries. The UN created a international standard testing certification process that every battery had to pass before you're allowed to transport it. And Transport Canada here and the equivalent in the States were then doing surprise you know, door visits to every company they could find selling and dealing with electric bikes um, to make sure that the people within that business only had batteries that had passed the testing and that the staff had been trained in the proper methods of dangerous good battery shipment, which does not allow you to pack a battery just in a cardboard box with a little bit of plastic padding around there. If it has extensive double line cardboard vermiculite uh, to absorb any leaks, uh, to quench any fires that take place. One of the things we did immediately after seeing this incident is insist that every company that supplied us with the lithium battery added a fuse between where the wires connect to the battery and where the circuit is that monitors and protects the battery. And what I talked about in that other box, these wires previously, this, this circuit totally protects the battery from stuff happening on the main wires that come out, but it doesn't provide any protection for the wires that are inside. And so a squishing of the insulation there will cause uh, cells to short circuit against one another and a huge electrical current inside the battery pack. Adding a little fuse here is a very simple way to ensure that any of those crushing events that short it would not cause anything more than a little self-resetting fuse to blow. Uh, so now I'm going to go over just a number of the other sort of quality control issues that we ran into dealing with batteries in this time period. Um, water ingress is of course a, a huge problem with an electric bicycle or any vehicle that's out on the road because you have to ride in all weather conditions and if the battery is not well sealed you get two problems. One is you can get battery, you can get water on the circuit board. Um, I haven't done a little anatomy of what's inside a lithium battery, but this circuit board is called a BMS circuit for battery management system. And it's a very critical part to the safety of a lithium battery. If you get water on that circuit, that water messes up all the internal signals. Um, the corrosion can completely uh, open the electrical traces that are on there. And then who knows what that circuit's gonna do. Um, so that circuit may no longer protect the battery. In most cases, it would artificially it would shut off the battery so you couldn't use it. Um, but in some cases, it became the origin points of uh, electrical fires. And all you need, this is an example where there's just one drop of water that landed on that circuit board. But because you have a high DC voltage, whenever there's a voltage and you have water connecting pieces of metal, you get galvanic corrosion and it quickly corrodes both circuitry, but also as you see up here, the actual metal cans of the cell. So if you have the lithium battery is sitting cooled in water, if it's in a plastic casing that allows water to get in but not to drain out, then you have all these 3.7 volt differences from each adjacent cell, all with metal exposed cans. That just causes electrochemical reactions, rust the metal and risk rusting right through the casing. Um, we also would see a lot of problems related to uh, the internal wiring connections in batteries. Um, Here's one where just the connector contact itself was not properly seated or got pulled out, or maybe just had something on the surface that now for not so great of a connection. And as that's discharging, that starts to arc and get hot, and that can be a potential ignition point. Um, we had tons of problems with fuses. Uh, you normally think a fuse is a great safety feature in a battery. Um, I have some more examples of, of fuses that are mounted on the casing that actually got so hot that it melted the plastic casing. Uh, so the fuses, uh, a poorly made fuse can actually become a heat source. This one here is one that never actually failed. Um, the fuse just got so hot that it melted and burned off the plastic, but it was still conducting. Um, and that a huge amount of that is just quality control of fuses. A little fuse like this looks the same. You can buy 
100 of them on AliExpress, you can buy them at Canadian Tire, you can buy them from legitimate manufacturers, and you don't know if that 40 amp fuse will actually blow at 50 amps or if it'll take 120 amps before the metal finally open circuit. Um, and here's an example of a company that had put a resistor in line with two wires, um, but it just, it's a resistor that's supposed to go on a circuit board. They wired it between wires with just a, a buck connection like that, which is extremely uh, high stress to put across the solder junction, and things like this can cause electrical arcing when that connection becomes intermittent. Um, we also saw a large number of cases where the tabs that link the cells together was a source point of failure. Uh, there are three main reasons that would cause this. Um, one of them, the most uh, kind of sneaky one, was fatigue failures. So a lot of these early batteries, they connect a bunch of cells in series and parallel to build the voltage and the uh, amp power capacity that you need. But they're also relying on that tabbing material to mechanically hold all the cells together. So if you don't have the cells supported by some other structure, this little thin sheet metal tab is what's holding it. So as you ride the bike with all the vibration and bumping, that eventually stresses and can crack the metal. And when that metal cracks, you get an intermittent connection. The battery can work, not work, work, not work. And in between those points, you can get electrical arcs that start to cause little burn marks on the paper, uh, can burn their way through the insulation of the cell. Um, another very common source for this was tab weld failures. So the metal connection tab is welded with the spot welder, but if that spot welding technique is not done to a high degree of standard, that will pop open, and then some cells become disconnected from the battery pack, um, and that can lead to a problem related to cell balancing. And finally, you could have cases where the, the tabbing material bridging them is just not sized for the amount of current that flows. Here, it failed basically like a fuse, so and that was the weak link. When this battery is being used and drawing excessive current, Instead of a fuse or a circuit shutting it off, the linking tab got so hot that the metal burned open. But if it doesn't burn open or before it burns open, it was glowing red hot. You all know how hot metal needs to gate before it actually melts apart. There's also problems we'd encounter from mechanical impact. An awful lot of the batteries sold in this era were simply uh, held together with soft heat shrink tubing. So you'd get a, plat uh, a battery with all the cells connected together, and then they'd put a PVC plastic shrunk over top, and that was the entirety of the battery. Well, if that's mounted on a bicycle sitting on a metal bike rack, there's points of contact with the, the entire weight of the battery is just pointing some you know, cylindrical pieces of hard metal, and that could wear through and cause denting of the cells. Um, here is an instance where somebody was riding their bike and they crashed and wiped out. Uh, the battery went skidding down the road, and as it was skidding down the road, um, encountering all kinds of mechanical trauma, it then just burst into flames and burned on the side of the highway. If you're going to have a battery burn, the side of the highway is as good a place as any, though. So uh, in some sense, he was lucky. Another very, very frequent source of failures that we would see with these batteries was the uh, battery management circuit and the wire leading to it. Um, so this example uh, looks terrifying. This was a case where it was actually a trucker who got a battery from us. And he, would, uh, he had an electric bike that he'd store in the back. He kept his battery just in the front passenger seat on the floor. Um, and one day he came back to his cab and it was just completely filled with smoke, um, burned residue everywhere, uh, went inside. And what we saw in there was this. Uh, and in this case, our assumption, none of the cells actually caught fire. There was no burning here. Um, we assumed that this was a case of an electrical overheating where something failed on the circuit and then a huge amount of electrical current was flowing through that circuit, causing everything to get hot. And that melts the plastic casing of the battery, a PVC casing when it gets hot and melts, releases all kinds of noxious fumes, but it's not a lithium battery fire, it's an electrical fire. Uh, this is another example of a similar situation. Um, here's an example of sort of the risks that a lot of these batteries uh, would present from these kind of electrical fire problems. This is just a very thin electrical wire and it just travels right over top, directly over these metal tab welds, which have an extremely sharp corner that can so easily cut right into that plastic insulation and then cause an internal short on the battery pack. Uh, so around this time period was also when e-bikes were starting to catch on in different parts of the world, and we were fairly connected with a lot of other players in the industry. Um, and we noticed something of an alarming trend that every year I had direct first or second hand awareness of two to three e-bike businesses in a similar situation of ours that were completely burnt to the ground. Um, this was a case in New Zealand where the guy had you know, a whole bunch of batteries, all his components in a warehouse uh, on his property, 
and the entire shed burnt down completely. Um, there was multiple cases in Seattle of bike stores burning down, um, and uh, and uh, some even dealers of ours died. In this case, it was a um, uh, it wasn't his store that burned down; it was his home. He had a bike that he was charging at home. Um, being a bike store dealer, he thought he knew, uh, you know, to to play on the more DIY risky side. Um, and he had a lithium polymer battery for his own bike, even though he would never sell that to his customers. Um, and that ended up burning down his house. Um, so this was happening all the time, but there was actually surprisingly little news or media about it. And I think in part because e-bikes were just not a mainstream news item. It was still this early adopter phase field that wasn't on the mainstream mind frame. Um, but one thing uh, happened around this period, and I wish I had been a little bit more on the ball, uh, which is that uh, smart people seem to be using these small little 18650 batteries instead of big cells. And to me, this was super counterintuitive because it meant you had way more batteries in the battery pack. You had way more weld points that could fail. Uh, and that would, by any first intuitive sense, greatly increase your odds of having an issue. Um, but Bionics was one of the first uh, electric bike companies in North America. And even in the early 2000s, their packs were made with these 18650 cells. To me, it made no sense. I didn't understand it. We thought, oh, we want a 10 amp hour battery. We get a 10 amp hour cell. Um, but that mentality was completely wrong. Uh, when you have a smaller size cell, it means that you can do a much better granularity when the manufacturer does the quality control and testing. If there's a tiny issue, a little speck of impurity, and it's in a big battery, you have a hard time detecting that. But if it's in a small battery, that same speck or impurity will manifest itself as a more pronounced difference in the cell's characterization. And it was also a format of cell that industry was massively optimizing its manufacturing techniques and its production in order to make it as reliable as possible since that was a cell that was in mainstream use on laptops like that. Um, so the companies that used 18650 cells in these early days had by far the fewest problems or issues with battery fires. Uh, Tesla would be another famous example of this where all the other auto manufacturers are getting these huge 200 amp hour batteries and they started their program with laptop cells to a lot of ridicule at the time. Um, but as awareness of this uh, safety benefit caught on, by the middle of the 2010s, virtually every single reputable e-bike that you could buy had 18650 cells in it. Um, that allowed the lithium cell industry to really focus all of its efforts on standardizing one production size and dial in every yeah, refinement that they needed. Right for Adventure Travel Show, presented by Chief Adventures at the BC Bike Show, starting at five minutes. Um, anyways, uh, suffice it to say that um, the industry moved entirely to 18650 cells. At the time, the popularity of e-bikes was exploding all over the world. There were still lithium fire incidents, um, but the ratio of the amount of fires per battery sold was improving vastly, vastly. Um, there were four kind of lead industry leaders that were really setting the pace for these 18650 cells. Those are Panasonic, Sony, Samsung, and LG. Um, and, um, but there are also lots of generic companies sort of following the trend because that was now, if you made that size cell, all kinds of uh, customers and end users would adopt it for their industry. Um, as well as the construction of the batteries was improving dramatically with mechanical holders for the cells, um, much better enclosures for the batteries that were less prone to water ingress, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at this point, I want to uh, point out that uh, not all 18650s are created equal, uh, not even close to that. Um, and as I mentioned, there are four industry leaders. Um, there are also all kinds of off-brand companies making similar looking cells. And when there were fire incidents, they were almost always related to this. <laughs> uh, companies not using a Panasonic cell or a Samsung cell. Um, there's, you know, Pedego is a huge electric bike uh, manufacturer in the U.S. at this time, one of, sort of the industry leaders, um, and they got lured into offering their battery with a equivalent Chinese cell that was less expensive, and then were forced to do a huge recall after having several fire incidents. Luckily, no one was injured, injured in that. Um, but anyone who really wanted to avert any risk would always stick to one of those four cell manufacturers because they seemed to understand what was necessary to have that you know one part per million or less uh, failure rate so now i'm going to just quickly uh, go over if you look at any you know what causes lithium batteries to catch fire if you look at the data sheet or any any reference on them they say you know never charge over 4.2 volts don't discharge below this voltage don't charge when a battery is really cold below freezing um, don't use excessive current. If you charge a battery really fast or discharge it at a much higher rate than it's rated for, that can cause problems. Of course, you don't want the batteries to get super hot. 
and of course you don't mechanically puncture the cells. But this is not advice you can really give to somebody who owns an e-bike because they don't dial what voltage they're charging their cells to. Um, they don't uh, similarly control at what voltage it ends at the discharging. All of that is managed by a separate circuit. Um, so as a user of an e-bike, you don't really need to worry about that because all of those protections are looked after through a circuit that's not just looking at the whole battery, but every individual cell within that battery pack. And that circuit prevents you from doing any of those things. So if that's the case, how is it that these batteries are catching on fire? You, you, obviously, we have seen, seen cases where companies didn't have a battery management circuit, but if that battery management circuit fails from, say, water ingress or poor design construction or a, uh, a bad soldering joint, then it potentially isn't going to offer this protection that you want to have in place. Um, and if that circuit's not doing its thing, then if you use the wrong voltage charger, you may end up with some situation where you could expose the cell outside of these conditions that it's meant to operate safely in. So that's just what I summarize here. Here I show an example of a battery pack that was giving some issues. And this is a case where when we measure one of the cells is at 3.4 volts, one is at 3.6 volts. Um, when you have unbalanced cells like this, if you have a, a situation where you can have it where while you discharge the battery, this one might go all the way down to zero volts when this battery still has three volts in it. This cell still has three volts. And you might not know that your overall pack is flat, even though one cell group is going flat within there. Um, the circuitry would prevent you from discharging. If the circuitry fails, this could be an avenue for which maybe that's the cause of these fires. But that is not what I think is the case. Uh, so here in preparation for this show, I thought it'd be really fun for us to actually take, we have piles and piles of old batteries of grin that we have slated for recycling. And I thought, well, why don't we show people what happens when we do these things, when we discharge a battery to zero volts and then recharge it? What happens when we charge it up to five or six volts per cell? What happens when we crush it? Uh, so over the last couple of weeks, we had pulled out a bunch of these batteries that we were going to send for a cycle and subject them to all these tests. Um, so we had a whole bunch of batteries that were drained to less than one volt per cell. So we started, okay, let's charge them. And I had known from experience, this is a, a friend of mine who had a full e-bike battery. It was left in storage for a while. The voltage got so low that the battery couldn't be discharged or charged. The circuitry was doing its protection, but being an engineering type, he thought he knew better. And so he opened up the battery to bypass the circuit so he could charge the cells directly because they were at too low of a voltage for the circuitry to allow charging. And while that battery was charging on his coffee table, uh, it started hissing, smoking, burst into fire. Luckily, they put the fire out before the house burned down. Um, and I thought, wow, this is a super dangerous thing to charge a battery that's been flat. So uh, what happened for all of our testing? Well, absolutely nothing. We just repeated this test again and again. We would charge the batteries that were sitting at half a volt, zero volts, and they would charge all the way up to 42 volts. Uh, they weren't hot. We had a thermal camera to look for hot spots. Um, it was rather surprising. Um, so then we went even further. We said, okay, let's take these batteries that are flat and let's actually reverse the voltage, that force current through a flat battery to give a negative voltage across it. Um, it was putting you know, at a negative voltage and then all of a sudden the discharging stopped. Um, and what we noticed happening is that the cells would basically have an open circuit. And that's because these modern lithium batteries, if a pressure builds up, there's a little safety cap that pops open and disconnects the cell. So our attempts at trying to sabotage a battery and all the bad things couldn't cause a fire. Then we took the thing that we knew would cause problems, which is overvolting the battery packs. So we were taking these batteries and charging them uh, right up to a 60 volt end of charge voltage, because um, that for sure would cause a fire. Um, and everyone talked about overcharging being the main um, risk here. And certainly when you have, there's a lot of scenarios where you can have that, um, you know, using the wrong voltage charge with a bad circuit could cause this to happen. Uh, we tried three different types of cells at three different currents, always charging them all the way up to 60 volts for a 36 volt battery. And then every time, at around 50 volts, 48 to 50 volts, the battery would just open circuit. We couldn't put any more current in because the safety protections kicked in. So what I would maintain here, and this is something that counters what you would, the impression you would have if you look at most of the media stories, is that the vast majority of the battery fires that you hear about and that are taking place are not customer misuse. So you'll see these articles saying, you know, how do you avoid a battery charger? Always use the official charger, never mistreat your battery. Um, but those aren't things that users are doing. If you look at the stories of these situations, they were just, they always had the stock charger that came with the battery. They were just charging it for normal. There are no early warning signs. 
They weren't we're using, using a, a small battery at super high currents. Uh, the batteries just spontaneously burst into flames and went into a thermal runaway. Um, and most of the time this happens while batteries are charging, but we've also had it happen, or heard of it happening, the battery is just sitting in storage. This has happened to some of the manufacturers that we deal with, but they just have wrapped themselves in the batteries, and then out of the blue, their entire solving catches fire, they burn, burn down the warehouse. Um, and sometimes, as you saw earlier, it happens while people are riding their bike. Um, but I would maintain that the cause of these is something defective inside the cell itself. Uh, it's not a situation of people abusing and misusing batteries. Um, this was a case, here was a batch. Um, uh, so this is a cell from LG. They were using this battery for years and years without any issues. And then within a span of several months, there were four or five incidents of battery fires well charging um, and uh, all traced down to one batch of cells. Um, uh, the situation just recently that you're all familiar with in Toronto of some of these e-bike bursting while they're walking onto a train. You don't hear many details, but obviously he's not charging the battery there. He's not discharging and the battery effectively spontaneously burst into fire. Um, from my observation, and I'd love to have some detailed statistics to, to back this up, um, but it seems that in order to make a lithium battery that is reliable to be have, you know, in public homes by the millions, um, you need an extremely large uh, operation that has just decades of experience doing high quality manufacturing. And there's really just three or four companies that can do that. And any of the other companies, when you get cells from them, you take, instead of it being a one in a million risk, it might be a one in a thousand risk or one in 10,000. And those odds really stack up quite unfavorably when you start having hundreds of thousands of bicycles on the market using them. Um, unfortunately, whenever you hear, see the reports of these incidents, they never dig down into which brand or which make and model of lithium cell was in the battery. And to me, I find this extremely frustrating um, because we're not able to actually understand what is the root cause and especially the solution to reduce the amount of incidents of battery fires that are happening. Um, from my own personal observations, I've yet to hear of any cases where it was a Panasonic cell that was responsible or involved in one of these battery fires, even though Panasonic is probably one of the leading uh, makes and models for all the high-end e-bikes that are out there. Wow. Why is uh, e-bike fires in the news so much? Well, people have all kinds of lithium batteries in their home. Lithium batteries and all your cordless power tools, and lithium batteries in your Bluetooth speakers, um, and uh, there's also lithium batteries in your electric bike. People don't hesitate about having all their you know, cordless power tools in their garage charging up. Those batteries are not as big of an e-bike battery, but they're still pretty substantial. And they can still cause a lot of damage if they do catch fire. Obviously, these are smaller batteries, so the risk when they do go on is not as significant as an e-bike battery. But ultimately, you don't hear nearly a number of news reports of people's cordless power tools catching on fire. And there's a reason for that. Uh, and that's because most cordless power tools are using good quality batteries. People don't go shop Alibaba to find the cheapest cordless power tool they buy. They go to Home Depot and pick up a DeWalt or a Milwaukee or a Makita from a brand that has a, you know, insurance or reputation to stand behind who will only use the most proven quality cells that they can get. Uh, E-bikes and electric scooters are unfortunately quite expensive, so people are much more incentivized to find cheaper avenues to buy these things. And so as a result, we see a far higher share of off-brand cells being used in the manufacture of these devices. Um, but for all for people within the bike industry who've looked at all these new reports taking place, it's almost across the board, not from you know a three thousand, four thousand dollar e-bike you buy from a bike store with a well-regarded brand battery on it, it's from any of the many fly by night operations that import fully bike some for cheap or people buying direct from China. And as a result, they're dealing with these much higher failure rates. So, so what's been heavily in the news and media is this idea of having UL certified batteries. So New York State passed legislation last uh, summer after sort of quite a high number. I think there's hundreds of 100 plus lithium battery fires caused from e-bikes to scooters in their state, uh, including a number of people dying, a number of apartments and houses burning down. Um, so they mandated that they would only allow batteries with UL certification within the city to be sold. Uh, and a lot of other places appear to be trying to follow suit. Um, UL was really late to come up with any kind of testing standard. When we look at this testing standard, it's almost just like the UN 38.3, the one we're already testing for shipping, but it has a few additional requirements for the circuitry 
extra redundant protection. So you can't just have one thing to protect you if the cell voltage goes low. There has to be a backup on there as well, which isn't a bad idea. As an engineer, it's, you kind of always want to have redundancy for anything safety related. Um, but what it doesn't do at all is specify which brands and models of cells you're allowed to use in the battery. So to have a UL a pack that passes UL testing, you need to change the battery management circuit that you're using. Oh, I guess I, I talked that into uh, on the next one. Uh, but um, but you can still use the cells that might have questionable statistical reliability. Um, what the UL listing requirement does for companies like ours is it means that for every battery model that we want to offer, any variation, any upgrade, we have to redo that testing, which is thirty to forty thousand dollars per battery model. Uh, our own company, we have probably 15 different models of battery pack, so that becomes an enormous upfront expense to do. It also means switching from battery management circuits that have a long legacy of a proven track record of being reliable to now using newer models and makes that haven't had the years of refinement in order to pass this UL requirement for redundant cutoff testing. Um, it has uh, radically changed the insurance landscape for companies selling electric bicycles. So at this point, you basically can't run an e-bike business and get insurance if all your batteries aren't UL certified because every insurer is aware of the risk posed and the industry has said, this is how we can rein in the number of incidents that are happening here. Uh, and, uh, and so the question is, is that gonna help things? Will that make this situation safer? Uh, and undisputedly, yes. Uh, not because the UL test adds anything great. It simply sets a benchmark barrier in order to sell into the market. You can't be a cheap Alibaba drop seller and pay $40,000 to have your batteries uh, UL tested. Um, and uh, that act in and of itself will reduce the amount of and rate of incidents that we see here. Um, but as I kind of point out here, you could do the same thing just by making every company pay into a racket before you're allowed to sell your battery into this market. Um, I'm not slamming on UL, but it is, uh, um, you, I'll get on their own website, they kind of mentioned that it's a great marketing tool, but when you buy a UL battery, UL is not guaranteeing that it's safe. And from all of my evidence here, if it's using those same cells that cause other problems, it's not gonna be any safer. Because the failures that we see are not the result of a redundant protection circuit not protecting over voltage or something. It always seems to be situations where the batteries are being used normally when they unexpectedly and spontaneously catch fire. Um, so a um, uh, little bit of takeaway here that if there's one thing that you want to do to be able to sleep at night easily with a battery charging by your bed uh, is try to have some assurance that you have authentic brand name cells inside that battery. Unfortunately, that's extremely difficult to do. One, most manufacturers don't disclose the make and model of cell that's inside there. It's not information they're willing to divulge. Uh, and secondly, even if they say it, there's a ton of counterfeit stuff that is across the Chinese market. So as a company that gets lithium batteries made, I can specify a cell I want the manufacturer to use, but I'm counting on them to have a trustworthy supply chain that they don't have a counterfeit cell that seems to give the same performance, but is actually not made by Panasonic or Samsung or LG. Um, so the risks of a lithium battery fire when you are using these kinds of cells is extremely low. Um, it's not zero, no one would ever say that it's zero, and people have seen incidents of you know, Samsung phones catching fire and the you know, massive recall that that caused from incidents at a way lower statistical rate than we see with electric bicycles. Um, but it's always there and it's always a good idea when you're charging your battery to ensure that it's in a place where there aren't flammables nearby. Uh, if you take this information and only ever want to charge when you're around or have it only charging outside, that's a totally fine safety choice. But the same would also apply to when you charge your cordless power tools or your laptop, because uh, they all pose the same kind of risk in that sense. Uh, but if you're using a battery where you're not sure of the origins of the cells inside there, or you have reason to doubt it, I would highly advise always assume that there's a chance the battery could catch fire and then plan your charging accordingly. So either when you're around so you can put it out or it's in a place where a fire itself would not cause loss of property or life to anyone nearby. Um, and that is uh, ultimately where I'm ending this conversation. So I think there's a minute or two for questions, uh, two minutes for questions. So I'll open up the floor to anyone who has one. I'll try. No. Okay. How to, how to extinguish? Okay. Uh, that's a great question. So his question is, how do you extinguish a fire if it does happen? Uh, one thing that you'll hear heard all the time is never put out a lithium battery fire with water because lithium reacts with water. That is completely incorrect. Uh, the best way to put out a lithium fire is to completely quench the cells with water. 
So what happens when the lithium batteries go into thermal runaways, they generate a lot of internal heat and that heat can propagate from cell to cell. The best way to suck that heat out of the burning pack is to douse it with water. Um, another option that works pretty good is CO2 fire extinguishers. So a CO2 extinguisher blasts it with carbon dioxide, but effectively dry ice because it comes out extremely cold. So not only do you suppress the oxygen to get the flames out, you also cool the pack in the process. The messiest thing to do, and we've learned this firsthand, is a standard ABC chemical fire extinguisher that will temporarily put out the flames. It will stop other stuff from burning. Um, but what happens is the flames will go out and then they'll just pop right back because it doesn't actually cool the overheating battery pack. Uh, we've also heard about dumping the batteries in sand. Um, that's kind of impractical for most people at home. You don't have a dump truck full of sand to pour over the battery. When we were doing those tests earlier to cause these batteries to catch fire for this presentation, we had buckets of water, buckets of sand and CO2 extinguishers, then we were going to show how those all perform. We just couldn't, for the life of ourselves, get a non-protected modern lithium battery to do anything. Uh, whether we overcharge, over discharge, it would just open circuit. That was it. No more current control. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. So he's asking about solid state batteries or future battery chemistry. Uh, there's kind of an ongoing meme in the whole industry about what's just around the corner for future battery breakthroughs, but solid state batteries are ones that have a lot of recent lab results. I have no firsthand idea of the actual safety difference of this chemistry. One thing a lot of people would tout is lithium iron phosphate instead of regular lithium iron. So that's a different flavor of lithium that is less pyroprone, but they still can and have caught fire. Um, but unfortunately, they're only half as much energy as you get with the lithium ion cells. And so much of the advantage and appeal of the lithium battery is lost when you go to a pack that weighs twice as much. Uh, but as far as what the future went to store, um, I look forward to it. Batteries are always improving, but the last decade of development has been incremental improvements in the current lithium ion. And they've gotten it to insanely high safety standards as long as it's from an industry player that understands how to make them to that high, high standard environment. Uh, all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your attendance. Uh, if you have more questions, uh, I'm at the booth for Grin Technologies, which is, uh, you'll see it over that way a little bit. And uh, thanks for your attention. Bye.